Welcome to episode one of Scaling Postgres. My name is Creston Jameson and I will be your host. Scaling Postgres is a free weekly show that curates content from around the web along with uh, my commentary to help you understand the best ways to scale and get the most performance from your Postgres database. I'm going to try and focus especially on those topics that are of interest to developers since typically the greatest performance gains are achieved by through database design and architecture and how you use it. In terms of format, I'm gonna be curating the best content from around the web and presenting it to you to help you understand how best to scale and get the most performance out of your Postgres database. All right, let's get started. All right, the first article that we're going to be covering is Testing Database Changes the Right Way. So this is an article from the Heap Analytics blog, and it talks about their petabyte scale cluster of Postgres instances. So if you had the question of does Postgres scale, clearly um, it does. Now, at a petabyte scale, they're not talking about a single database, but from my recollection, they are sharding uh, their database. So there's multiple databases that handle that petabyte scale of data that they're working with. Um, but nonetheless, they are seem to be on the forefront of pushing Postgres in terms of the amount of scaling and the amount of data it can handle. Now, this is an interesting article because it tells you how they um, test database changes before they push them to production. So they discuss some things that didn't work and then talk about how they've come up on the solution of using a shadow production. So basically they clone out segments of their production database um, and share traffic with um, production and the shadow um, database and make changes to the shadow portion and check for changes to see how that works. And they go into detail about how they um, populate it, how they mirror um, the reads and writes uh, to make sure that uh, they're getting accurate results and then analyzing them. And then they go into an example of where uh, they were rolling out table partitioning and they used this technique in order to assure that their rollout uh, went off without a hitch. So I highly encourage you to check out this post, um, particularly if you're looking to scale to a significant level. Now. Another thing about this post is that it also has links to three articles that are um, equally valuable as well if you're looking to scale. Um, so, for example, this uh, first link here is running 10, it has the title Running 10 Million PostgreSQL in Indexes in Production and about how they serve their customers through utilizing a lot of, I believe, their um, partial indexes. Uh, the next article is Basic Performance Analysis that Saved Them Millions, uh, I believe that's millions of dollars, as well as how they're analyzing the performance of millions of SQL queries to basically eke out the best performance. So I definitely suggest this checking out this blog post as well as the associated uh, ones as well. So for our next article, um, it's actually a presentation that's been placed on SlideShare. Uh, the title is Postgres SQL at 20 terabytes and beyond. Um, what's a little interesting about this is that actually it is a, another example of a cluster of databases. In the total cluster, the amount of data it's managing is um, 400 terabytes. So it's essentially 20, 20 terabyte uh, Postgres SQL databases that they're using to um, do their analytics. And it's basically doing their analytics at a massive scale. So sometimes it's hard to track uh, with a presentation what's going on, but um, this basically gives you insight into how um, they're using it to ingest data to, to process all of this and using Postgres um, for that. And like looking at the um, last couple of slides here, um, they're basically state that they're using PostgreSQL as a big data platform and it provides real-time analytics to users' actions. Um, and they still have yet to outgrow PostgreSQL given uh, the size that they are. So again, this is another case of if you're looking to scale, here's another example of an organization that is 
um, using Postgres in interesting ways to basically manage a lot of different data. Our next article, we're going to look at Rustproof Labs. So in this blog post, they cover Postgres version 10, parallel queries, and performance. So basically, they're looking to see what kind of difference parallel queries can have for uh, the performance of different queries. So they discuss some of their testing methodology, and they have these great charts that show you their different simple queries that they've done, and they're comparing uh, Postgres 9.5, uh, not 9.6, but that's that's okay. But at least they have a control of Postgres 10 here where they have disabled the parallel execution. So you probably the most apples to apples is comparing Postgres 10 single to Postgres 10 parallel. And you can see um, significant differences in terms of execution time for simple queries. Um, and, you know, they make the statement just upgrading to Postgres 10 essentially gives you a performance increase. And also mention a warning. Um, if you're setting the max parallel workers per gather greater than the number of cores, that seems to cause a decrease in performance. So you want to be aware of that if you're uh, checking out enabling uh, this for your Postgres database. And then they go into a more complex example and show the results here too. And again, they're getting um, a fairly good performance uh, increase uh, almost twice as fast with the parallel execution times. And then they also mention the CPU time where it's, uh, as one would think, the actual CPU usage increases as well. So if you're using Postgres 10, uh, this is a great article to look at to review um, some of the settings you can make and think about how you want to configure it for the best performance, um, as well as just showing at some third-party evidence of the improvements that they've made with Postgres 10 versus the uh, version 9 series. In our next article, we're going to look at Postgres rocks except when it blocks understanding locks. And this is from the Citus data blog. And they talk about how, of course, Postgres is great at doing highly concurrent transactions. Um, but you do need to understand how locking works, particularly when certain locks are need to be exclusive or shared or things of that nature. So this is a great table that they present. And you know, I'm thinking about printing this out for myself, but it basically looks at, uh, given the different operations in Postgres, what can run concurrently safely together. So selects can run with selects, uh, in amongst insert, update, deletes uh, is perfectly fine. Uh, but things get interesting. Like say you need to create a trigger in a table. Well, you can pretty much only do selects while you're creating that trigger. Otherwise, insert, update, and delete statements are going to be blocked. Whereas when you need to do an alter table, essentially everything uh, will, it'll need an exclusive lock on that to be able to make that change. So it's a great thing to check out this blog post for. And it also goes over uh, an example, a quick example here of where you're doing a select and how this can uh, essentially have your table lock preventing a select from happening. And it also has another table where it goes into a uh, difference between shared and exclusive locks uh, for what you're trying to, to achieve. So that's another th good thing to take a look at. Now, it also goes over the system table PG locks and tells you how you can find useful information from uh, the system table for Postgres, telling you the status of different locks in the system and what's going on. Now, in addition to this post, the other uh, very interesting post that has a lot of uh, beneficial information uh, in terms of our next article is, again, from the Citus Data blog, when Postgres blocks, seven tips for dealing with locks. So pretty much everyone should probably take this and post it up and have it as a readily accessible reference uh, as you're planning uh, database changes. Uh, so step number one, never add a column with a default value because basically when you do this the entire table will essentially have to be rewritten uh, with 
new rows with that default value added, which can block read and write activity. As opposed to doing that, that they suggest adding the column without a default and then updating it. And of course, if you have a very large table, that even that update statement to prevent uh, extended locking occurring, you're going to want to break up your updates uh, in batches. So point number two, beware of lock queues. Use lock timeouts. Because locks are in a queue, they can block up behind one another as one is waiting. So if you have a long, like the example they list here, if you have long running update, insert statements, or even select statements, um, and this alter table command needs an exclusive lock on that table, it needs to wait until that's done. But the problem is every other, say, insert statement or update statement that's happening afterward is going to be blocking because this is first in the queue to happen. So basically you start blocking your entire table for activity. So what they suggest is to set a lock timeout to two seconds right before you run this command so that if it isn't able to acquire the lock it needs to do alter the table, it's going to um, time out after two seconds. So definitely a val valuable thing to do. Point three is create your indexes concurrently. And again, this is definitely the golden rule of Postgres SQL as they state here, uh, is to always create your indexes concurrently so that you don't block uh, writes uh, to your table while you're creating indexes. Uh, point four is take aggressive locks as late as possible. So basically using your knowledge of locks, load into a new table and then do a renaming as opposed to doing a long running operation within a transaction. So basically you want to keep your trends in general, you want to keep your transactions as short as possible. If you're updating data, for example, keep you the duration that that transaction is open as small as possible. So point five is adding a primary key with minimal locking. And basically long running things, you don't want to maintain a lock open for a very long time, uh, which is adding the primary key, what it will do, because it has to add the index. Uh, again, the proposed workaround is to create a unique index concurrently, again, the rule number three they mentioned, um, on that column, and then adding that primary key constraint to the table will be fast because the uh, index, the unique index in this case, would have already been created. Uh, point six, never vacuum full. Uh, vacuum is usually sufficient, and it's interesting what they put here. Uh, quote, please freeze my database for hours if you do a vacuum full. Uh, so definitely a good uh, thing to take to not to. And point seven, avoid deadlocks by ordering commands. I personally haven't seen a lot of... Uh, this deadlocks, but I think it's more if you're using a lot of transactions in your application, like explicit begin, uh, commit, and uh, rollback type thing. Uh, if you're doing a lot of that, I think it's there's a higher probability that a deadlock will happen. Um, however, my experience, I haven't really seen uh, much of this, but uh, they give some good advice here on how to avoid uh, deadlocks by ordering your commands. All right, in our next post, we're looking at uh, migrations and long transactions in Postgres, uh, which is a blog from the Finn Exploration Company. Uh, so this goes right back to the previous, related to the previous article in terms of locking queues uh, in Postgres. So essentially, they were adding a column to a table without a default, um, but things started slowing down 20 minutes. The database migration they were running still hadn't completed. Uh, so they're trying to figure out what was going on. And after investigation, they were running a long running um, backfill of some old data. Once they stopped that, the migration finished immediately. So again, they were doing an update uh, in a long transaction that kind of started locking up other actions from happening once this alter table was trying to occur. And he goes into, again, looking at the PG locks table and the different uh, locks that get created and basically kind of replicates what happened in his instance, uh, as well as 
talks about uh, his takeaways and prevention strategies. Although what would also assist um, is definitely from the previous post uh, where they were talking about setting a uh, lock timeout. So the next blog post comes from PG Steph's blog and it's Introduction to Postgres Automatic Failover. And he's basically talking about um, PAF, which is also known as Postgres Automatic Failover, uh, which is a resource agent for providing high availability for Postgres SQL based on Pacemaker and Corosync. So if you're at the stage where you're wanting a high available, highly available cluster that fails over to a replica uh, without manual intervention, this post uh, definitely shows how you can do that using Pacemaker as well as this um, resource agent to be able, to, and he goes through the whole process of setting up the server. Uh, so if you're at that point, uh, I definitely encourage you to check out this uh, blog post for that. And last is kind of a little bit like a fun blog post um, from the second quadrant Postgres SQL blog uh, called Postgres SQL Maximum Table Size. So basically the maximum table size in Postgres is 32 terabytes. And as they say, it's been that way for many years. Yeah. One of the ways it's, it's wrong, he's saying here, is that you can adjust the block size to make it uh, larger. Uh, in addition, they're talking about table partitioning and how in Postgres 10, they have now have declarative partitioning, which makes partitioning easier. Uh, but they also resolved a, blo excuse me, a bug in Postgres SQL 11, uh, David Rowley has found the bug, where basically he you could expand the number of subtables allowed for partitioning. So in Postgres 10, it only allowed 65,000 <laughs> partitions, which is still quite a lot. But now you can go to the full size of the number of partitions allowed. Uh, so basically, this is very interesting. Maximum table side is of 32 terabytes, Postgres 9.6, two exabytes in 10, and 131 yottabytes in Postgres SQL 11. So that does it for episode one of Scaling Postgres. To get all the links for the articles in this episode, check the link in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com if you'd like to sign up to receive uh, weekly notifications of these episodes, or you're also welcome to subscribe on YouTube or iTunes. Thanks. <laughs>